So I want to present a brief overview of Ephesians chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can flip to that. Uh, there's no way I can plumb the depths of this chapter. Uh, I always bite off more than I can chew, so uh, I'll have to skip around a little bit. But um, nonetheless, I want us to get a, a, a flavor of what the Apostle Paul, uh, how he addresses a church and what does he say. So um, I saw... Oh, it's been a couple years ago now. I thumb around on Facebook from time to time, and I saw this meme that said, uh, it feels good to be lost in the right direction. And it shows like a picture of a, like, a hiker out in the woods, you know. And I, I thought to myself, that is stupidity. That doesn't even make any sense. But on the surface, it kind of feels good, like, you know, I just go where I'm going. and, and But... It, the root of that is just nonsense. Uh, society is kind of fickle like that. They come up with these little things that kind of feel good in the moment. But for the church of God, for us, truth is to build into the ethos of Christian community. We're given truth as a foundation for what we do, what we say, how we act, our obedience, our boldness. And so rather than me come up here and try to give you a, a self-help speech, I want to just simply, as one pastor has put it, retalk God's talk. I want to just present to you what we're given in Ephesians. Um, this, these scriptures that we're going to read are going to reinforce who you are in Jesus Christ. When a plant is ripped from its soil, or you place it in the wrong soil, what happens? Yeah, it dies. That's right. The Lord, through the Apostle Paul, will lay down in this scripture text a rich bed of soil to sink your roots into so that we might flourish and thrive in the richness of God and who He is for us in Christ. The nourishment that the opening lines of this letter give to us are provided so we might feast upon this rather than the junk food of money or possessions or carefully planned circumstances, human approval, any other thing that promises lasting joy, but it only delivers short, fleeting happiness. It falls short. Here in Ephesians is God's gift to you, believer. Let's read, uh, I'll read uh, the first 14 verses of Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance 
with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. That doesn't make the hair stand up on your neck. Picture in your mind's eye a long line that you are standing in a long line in New York City. You've been given free tickets to the biggest and most talked about Broadway show ever released. Your, anticip your anticipation grows as the time for the play approaches. You eventually enter in, you take your seat. A few minutes later, an employee of the theater comes to you and says, you, come with me. And you think to yourself, am I in trouble? At least that's what I would think. So as you are escorted away from your seat, the usher says to you, you've been selected to receive a backstage pass. What an amazing opportunity. So as you are taken backstage, you are allowed to see what is not seen by everyone else. All the commotion, the busyness of actors scurrying around, stagehands, wardrobe personnel, lighting technicians. This whole array of activity goes on behind the curtain in order for the presentation of the show to go as planned. In the same way, here in Ephesians chapter 1, God pulls back the curtain in this grand display of his saving work. And he gives us a backstage pass so that we might see what goes on behind the scenes. See, the gospel of Christ goes out. It goes out to our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. All the nations will hear this. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live in, in all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and their boundaries of their habitation. He orchestrated the time of your birth, the places we would live, the families we would have, and the friends and various people we would know, and that we would hear the gospel and believe it. To affect and to carry out his choice of us. People hear the message. Some believe, some don't. But God doesn't desire for us to merely focus on the play itself, but to tune in to what's happening backstage, to see all that he has done, and to not only make you a viewer, but to make you an active participant, so that you can see and experience God's grace. Look at the opening lines of this letter again. I have a few things that uh, I'd like to note here. Look at verse 1 one more time. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So this is written by the apostle Paul. He wrote this from prison in Rome about the year 60 to 62, historians guess. Um, but the authority that Paul has to write such things doesn't come from himself. It comes from his apostleship in Christ Jesus. You see, I, I'm going to give you some technical data here. A uh, few of you are probably uh, aware that this is coming. This, this point here is a Greek genitive. Now, that simply shows possession. That's the most common use of the genitive. So literally, you could translate this, that Paul is Christ's apostle. So he belongs to Jesus. And what he says is under the inspiration and authority of God. So what we have read comes from him through Paul to us. We see that it was written to the saints at Ephesus. Now, it's interesting to note, I was looking at some of the manuscript evidence uh, here this uh, last night, and uh, it's in interesting to note that three of the earliest manuscripts that we have actually omit the words at Ephesus. It doesn't say that. It'll most likely say that in your Bible. But the earliest manuscripts don't actually have that in there. So we can conclude that it was likely a letter that was copied and circulated to many of the early churches. So it was like a chain letter. 
So it wasn't necessarily specific for the church at Ephesus. This was circulated around the Mediterranean region. This was, here's my point, this was the sound doctrine that was read and taught everywhere then, and it should be read and taught now to every church in every age. Look at a couple of things here in the next two verses. Look at verses 2 and 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So notice that grace and peace is from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to make a comparison here. The, see, the world, grace and peace that the world gives is cheap and meaningless. It doesn't sustain Many of you have noticed, I'm sure, that the world substitutes for these things are available. They're usually for sale. Perhaps some of you have bought them thinking that the consequences and, well, the consequences of buying them is that we're attempting to correct eternal problems with temporal solutions. The grace and the peace that is lasting and meaningful and eternal must come from the eternal one and not a mere mortal. God gives us this, not merely in his stuff, but in himself. That's what Paul's telling us here. Again, here's two more cases of the genitive case, possession. God, our Father, verse 2, and our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3. So the Father and the Son belong to us. We belong to them. Now, Here's what I'm not saying. It's not somehow God belongs to us in that sense, like we take possession. Obviously, that's not what it's saying. Rather, it's an expression of intimacy between us and him. It's a term of endearment for a believer in Jesus. Let that sink in. He's not distant. He's near to us. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Now, where is this blessing found? This is commonly overlooked. So it's important we see this. I want us to see the prepositions in the sentence. Now, preposition, you know what prepositions are? It's in, through, over, under, around. Those are English prepositions. Look at the prepositions. In fact, let's look at all of them in this section. I'll just name them off here. Verse 3. This is where the blessings are found. In Christ. I'm just going to shotgun through these. Verse 4. In him. Verse 5 through Jesus Christ to himself. Verse 6, in the beloved. Verse 7, in him. Verse 9, which he purposed, in him. Verse 10, in Christ and in him. Verse 12, in Christ. Twice in verse 13, in him. Are you getting the picture? <laughs> if you want the blessings of God, the intimacy of God, the adoption, the inheritance, everything, we must be in the one who possesses those things. And that is a really short list. That is Jesus Christ. We must be in him. It's not merely knowing about him or it's being in him. The preposition is so important. And it's often we just read right over that. Any other religious conformity, whether Jesus' name is attached to it or not, will not give you that blessing. This is, this is often done, I'm going to try not to be a negative Nancy here, but this is often done in so-called Christian churches because they try to give something that they don't themselves possess. You must be in Christ to have this blessing. So how does this become our reality? And when was this determined by God? Let's look at the text. I want to put our attention on three verses. Verses 4, 5, and 11. How does this become our reality, and when was this determined by God? Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, 
in love, verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Now drop your eyes down to verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So you see it, a clear pattern that Paul brings this up over and over again in this text. Um, it's likely, I'm going to speculate here, it's likely that he had perhaps Old Testament Israel in mind, in which Israel was chosen from all the nations of the, of the, uh, of the world, or perhaps even his own conversion. You remember his conversion in Acts chapter 9? Saul of Tarsus, is how Luke referred to him at that section, was not seeking to know God. Um, in fact, he was seeking to throw Christians in jail and was persecuting the church. Then, God showed up. So there is the proud, zealous, young man, blinded, and on the ground before a holy God. Jesus. What does he say? What does he say about Paul's conversion? He says, he tells, uh, what was his name, Ananias, I think later, who uh, was scared that, they was, that Paul was coming to his house. He, this is what the Lord says, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Christ not only chose Paul, but he chose and determined who he would preach to and what his ministry would look like. But now, look back at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And you see that word predestined there. He predestined us. So uh, from the Greek, here's what that word literally means. The word predestined means predestined. I solved the mystery. <laughs> uh, it's the Greek word pro orizo, and uh, it simply means to decide upon beforehand or to predetermine. That's what the word means. A uh, little more technical data for you, but I'll break it down. This is an aorist active participle, which, and he here's basically what that means that God, in the past, and in this case, eternity past, was the active agent in making the choices. And if you think about it, really, he was the only one making choices because nothing else existed. No thing had yet been made. And maybe a lot of questions are popping into your minds right now. Um, the text isn't going to address all of those questions. I wish it would, for my sake, for your sake, but it does not address all of the questions that, are ar that will arise. But it does answer a very significant question. Why? Why did he do this? Let's look at the text. Look at the end of verse 4. I'm going to shotgun through some things again for time's sake. Look at the end of verse 4. In love. Verse 5. According to the kind intention of his will. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Verses 7 and 8. The riches of his grace which he lavished on us. Literally, that reads, he made abundant toward us. Verse 9, his kind intention. Verses 12 and 14, to the praise of his glory. So let me summarize all that for you in a sentence. God is love. He is kind. He is rich in his grace. He is abundant toward us that we might praise Him in His glory, that's why He did it. That's why. So, what took place, that answers the when, what, what took place in order for this holy union between the holy and the unholy to take place? See, that's, that's kind of like oil and water. It's, it's good for us to feel the tension of how does holy and unholy come together? Where my mind goes was like Exodus chapter 20. Um, let me just read it real quick. Just a quick section, verse 18. Um, all the people, remember 
God descends on Mount Sinai to give the law to Moses and the people, and here was the people's response. All of the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And then they said to Moses, speak, speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. So, this is a, you've read the text in, in Scripture, where no one shall see God and live. This is a holiness that kills. We should feel the tension. How do unholy people like us, how do we come to this holy God? It's an awesome question that the text answers. Let's look at verse 7. In him, that is Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Wow. Um, so I'm going to turn this on its head. Uh, I did something interesting, and I'm just going to share it with you. I googled the word redemption. <laughs> just type it into Google search, redemption. Here's the two definitions it gave me. Number one, the action of saving or being saved from sin. Uh, sin, error, or evil. Number two, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment or clearing a debt. That's Google. <laughs> Whoever said technology was bad, right? Um, well, a broken clock's right twice a day. So I'll leave it at that. The English word for redemption is the word apolutrosis. It means, listen to this, to release from a captive condition. To release from a captive condition. We were slaves to sin, being held captive, and Christ ransomed us. How did he do that? Verse 7, three words. Through his blood. Hmm. I've had the pleasure with visiting with many of the pastors in our area. Um, we, my wife and I, we took a few years where we were uh, doing some other forms of ministry in the area, so I visited some other churches, not to desire to attend, but just to hear what was going on around the area and sat down with some of the pastors. Um, unfortunately, it grieved my heart to hear some of the things that they say and they teach. Many no longer even preach about sin, one pastor told me he doesn't even mention the word sin. And so I had to probe, and these are nice conversations. I'm just, we're talking. I asked him why. He replied, well, if you mention it, then you have to define it. Others said that it was okay for people to continue in a sinful lifestyle, ignoring the warning passages of Scripture that those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Their blood is on those men's hands. At best, at best, they're believers forfeiting their joy. But the worst I've heard yet is a denial of the cross of Christ. One pastor told me he, quote, hates atonement theology. He said that Christ dying to forgive sin placating the wrath of God in our place, and therefore creating peace between us and the Father, that's just left over from Roman Catholicism, he told me. There's no place for it in the modern church, he said. I couldn't disagree more. His problem is not with Rome, but with the Scriptures themselves. Listen, Romans 5.9, much more than having been justified, that's made right with, legal declaration, been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That's Romans 5.9. 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself, that is Christ, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed not to mention the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. I didn't even touch on the Old Testament. These aren't quotes from Vatican I or the Council of Trent. These are quotes from the Bible. 
if I've only submitted to an outward moral conformity and not been transformed on the inside out by the Spirit of Christ, then I have only fearful judgment coming to me. If Christ hasn't absorbed God's wrath for my sin and given me his perfect righteousness, his perfection, then I will rightly be punished for my sin. All I'm left with, if I don't have Christ, is my own righteousness, and that's not a righteousness at all. But Christ has ransomed, ransomed us. We just read it. How do, how do we know? How do we know that Christ's work is sufficient to actually save us? Let's look over at, uh, we didn't read the text, let's look, look over at verses 18 to 23 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Let's look across the page here. I'll just read it. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Think about that for a minute. I'll pause right there. Think about that, of the might and the strength and the power that has been brought to us, to us who believe. I'll continue. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. Here it is. When he raised him from the dead. And he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, that every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And that he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, that's you, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is why. This Christ was raised from the dead for you. Death could not hold him. He had no sin to warrant a death. His death was for us as our substitute for our sin. And God raised him from the death as his stamp of approval that this is a righteous sacrifice for us and therefore we go free. Therefore, God highly exalted Jesus to his right hand above all rulers and authorities. This Christ did not and could not fail in his saving work for you. And now he lives to intercede for you, Romans says. So, begs another question. How do you know you're saved as an individual? Like, how do I know all these grand things about Jesus apply to me? It's a good question. Let's let the text answer it. Look at verses 13 and 14. Now, I know I'm skipping around, but for time's sake, to go through this entire section, we'd be here four hours. So, <laughs> I got an amen, great. Verses 13 and 14. Uh, in him, Ephesians 1, in him... You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the, to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now, my NASB that I usually study from here uh, translates the word sealed. You see that word sealed in him in verse 13? Um, it, it's the words fragizo. It translate. It, tr it means uh, to mark with a seal as a means of identification. To mark with a seal as a means of ident identification. That's what the word sealed means. Um, so God has placed His mark on you, believer. He has placed His mark on you. That's what the word means. To mark with a seal to identify who you are. God has placed His mark on you. You know it. Everybody else should as well. You won't act and talk and behave like everybody else in the world because he has his mark on you. We know what the people of the world have for a mark. It's not a computer chip, if you're wondering. Listen to what the people of the world say. 
Look, look, watch what they do. Look how they live their lives. You'll see the mark that they have, plain as day. But our mark is the Holy Spirit of promise. That's what verse 13 says. That's the mark given to us. And he's given as a pledge. And I like the way that the King James renders that, actually. The King James words it, the Holy Spirit is given as earnest. Those of you reading from King James Bibles, you'll see that. It's earnest. So we're familiar with the concept of earnest money when we buy a house. It's uh, non-revocable and non-refundable. So when God gives you something in earnest, he doesn't take it back. And he won't go back on his promise. And notice in verse 14, this is a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So for him to give the Holy Spirit and then take it back later would effectively remove the praise of his glory and God won't do that. <laughs> will not share his glory with another. He does what is glorious. This should cultivate joyful praise. It should be a warm blanket for the heart of a believer on a cold day. So, it's obvious by now that the apostle has opened up the letter with a load of indicatives here. Now, an, an indicative is simply a statement of a fact. Um, I'm sure most of you have read the entire book of Ephesians, maybe several times, it's fairly short. Uh, and if you remember, the letter has several imperatives. Imperatives are commands. Uh, here's se several of the imperatives from the book of Ephesians itself. Um, walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Uh, speak the truth, each one of you, to his neighbor. Or he who steals must steal no longer. Or be imitators of God. Or wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Or husband, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loves the church. Children, obey your parents. Slaves, be obedient to your masters, etc. This letter is full of imperatives, full of commands. Unfortunately, many skip over the indicatives. Those are the facts. They skip over the indicatives that are purposely placed at the beginning of the letter. Or worse yet, they completely reject these indicatives that are obviously taught here, and they're for our good, for our benefit. See, the Lord has thoughtfully placed the indicatives prior to the imperatives. He's placed the facts of who you are prior to ever commanding you to do something. Is that, am I making clear on that? Here's the danger. Here's the danger. An attempt to live out the imperatives, the commands, in the absence of the indicatives, the facts of who you are, will give you nothing but meaningless and depressing legalism. I'll say that one more time. An attempt to live out the imperatives in the absence of the, indicati of the indicatives will give you nothing but meaningless and depressive legalism. Who you are in Christ is what fuels what you do in your life. See, let me give you an illustration to help make this a little more clear. What happens when you put a diesel in a gasoline pickup? <laughs> Doesn't run very long, does it? Uh, what if there's no fuel in the tank at all? Yeah, you're out of gas. That's right, Kelly. So your only option is to push the vehicle if you want it to go anywhere. Uh, you won't make it to your destination, and it's exhausting. See, these indicatives at the beginning of Ephesians are the fuel in your tank. Anything else won't cut it. God designed it that way. That's why we have Ephesians chapter 1. He owns the pickup. He knows the proper fuel to keep it running. So i got to mention here, perhaps you're not a follower of Jesus. Perhaps you're not a believer, you, and you're listening to this. If you feel like a child peering into a candy store window, now what? Well, come on in. What will amaze you is once, once you step in, once you step in, the owner of the store 
knows you by name. And he's been waiting for the exact day that he planned for you to arrive. Come to Christ. Those who truly come to him will never be disappointed. He'll never turn you away. Because if you want him, he's yours. Finally, I know that many have allowed their experiences in life, human reason, to determine God's method of saving people. But notice that God says repeatedly that this method and this message are His. Look at the possessive pronouns. I'm again going to shotgun through these. Verse 5, according to the kind intention of His will. Verse 6, to the praise of His glory. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood. Later in the verse, according to the riches of His grace. Verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things according to His will. Verse 14, this is the praise, this is all to the praise of His glory. Now, Notice how intimate God is with us. I said earlier I'd touch on this again. Look back one more time at verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. So, He isn't distant and far from us. No. No. This adoption as sons through Jesus is to Himself. You see that in the text. See the reflexive pronoun? It's Himself. He is very intimate, very close, and very personal. Lastly, the sermon isn't designed to answer theological objections. There's a time and a place to have those discussions. Honestly, The text of Scripture isn't designed to answer objections, but to encourage and strengthen the saints. That's us. This is given to us to build us up, to establish us in truth. So when we're we're experiencing difficulty, suffering, that this is what God has done for us. If your mind immediately raises objections, rather than rejoicing in who God says He is for us in Christ, we risk... Missing the blessings of joy that he intends for us to walk in. I absolutely believe in the proclamation of sound doctrine and good biblical teaching, but I don't think, I don't think it's the biggest problem for followers of Jesus. This might be a bit controversial, but I want people to think. No, not believing the doctrines of Ephesians 1 is not the biggest problem. Not believing the God who inspired Ephesians 1 is the biggest problem. Let's say that again. Not believing the doctrines of Ephesians 1 is not the biggest problem. It's not believing the God who inspired Ephesians 1. You see, living a life of faith, belief in Christ, should bring about a corresponding life that bears witness to it. Doctrine informs practice. We should immerse ourselves in the Scriptures thinking deeply about these things because, as Jesus says, to whom much is given, much is required. We own Bibles. We know how to read. This is a gift. If, if, this is be, if, if we look at this and it's like, oh, I should read my Bible, then that should lead you how to pray before you ever open your Bible. And I struggle with that as well. We'll have to give an account for how we've stewarded these gifts that we've been given. So here's my big idea. Obeying Christ, because obedience, I think we'd all agree, is important. We don't want to live in sin. Obedience, obeying Christ is not only tied to what we believe about Him, but what He says about us. I'll say that again. Obeying Christ is not only tied to what we believe about Him, but what He says about us. God wrought obedience does not happen in a vacuum. Charles Spurgeon, 
the great prince of preachers, said this, I am persuaded that the doctrine of predestination is one of the softest pillows upon which the Christian can lay his head, and one of the strongest staffs upon which he may lean in his pilgrimage along this rough road. Beloved. This is Spurgeon, this is me talking now. Beloved. You are loved. You are loved. God has gone through great lengths to bring about the saving work of Jesus in your life. And he has began this work before he ever created anything. Rest in this. Rejoice in this. And stand firm in this. This is the fuel in your tank for obedience and for boldness, which we all want, and for future perseverance. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. I love you.